six years ago from the U.S. and as a relatively recent immigrant, I'm impressed with the Canadian cultural traits of civility, moderation, and inclusivity, as well as the palpable sense of shared community and purpose in this country. Visual arts play a role in the ability to tolerate an open discussion of ideas and opinions. The Canadian people and government actually support the fine arts as an important part of the culture. Diverse venues for the exhibition of artworks and ideas form the Canadian cultural landscape, and great distances shape the geographical landscape, separating visual arts communities across the country. Along with artist-run centers and public galleries, commercial galleries like DC3 Art Projects constitute an important part of this network. David Candler's dedication and visionary approach are embodied in DC3 Art Projects. The gallery brings the work of artists from Saskatchewan, Quebec, BC, Ontario, and other provinces to visual arts communities and audiences in Edmonton and provides a platform for Edmonton and Alberta artists to exhibit their work outside the province. The galleries recently invited participation in Volta New York, and Volta 13 in Basel, and Art Toronto. The current exhibition, Isaacson, presents a collaborative multimedia work by Aaron Munson, David Hoffus, Daria Minsky, and Gary James Joins. It's open through February 17th. So I'm happy to have uh, David here to talk to us tonight. I'm looking forward to it. Please welcome David Candler. great honor to be asked to speak at this um, and I'd like to thank everybody involved. I'd especially like to thank Jesse um, for uh, um, starting this program. I think that having people outside, from outside any community, come into a community to discuss their views, their visions, their ideas, to, um, to share what they see or think about the world is a really important part of opening up minds in this place. Um, and so I think this has been long due, and, and, and kudos to Jesse and, um, and to the rest of the team in setting up a really great um, lineup of speakers, apart from myself. Um, and uh, I hope that that's something that can continue because I think it's really, really essential to the growth of what is a vibrant, creative community that I think can be even better than it is. And I think this is an important part of it. I'm going to speak to you from the point of view of somebody who loves visual arts, who loves artists, um, and who has no artistic skill whatsoever. Uh, I'm an outsider, and I have no academic qualifications whatsoever. So anybody who wants to nail me to that cross, it's going to be an easy job. Um, however, I have a lifetime of looking, 
and thinking about art. And I, um, I really feel that artists do some of the really heavy lifting for society. And I don't think they get enough credit for that. I think it's a really, really difficult job. And I think that the importance of people in the creative fields is that they are asking the rest of us difficult questions. And that it should be their job. Not to provide answers, not to provide an object or a pretty thing, but to throw up ideas, to throw up questions, uh, and then simply leave them there for the rest of us to try and come up with our own answers. And that's a difficult thing to do. It's also brave because it means that as artists, um, you are putting yourself and bits of your spleen and your heart and your brain on display for people to either love or hate or to call down or to, um, to denigrate. And, and that's a very brave thing to do. So that's why I love artists. And I think that ultimately, when we are all dust, the thing that is left over is what artists have created. And that's something we've seen from ancient history. Nobody remembers typically the names of the gladiators, but we all can see the Colosseum. Nobody remembers the names of the enslaved who built the pyramids, but the pyramids remain. And that is the importance of art. And so when we're all dust, some of that will remain and that will be eventually how we're studied and judged. So I'm just going to um, make sure that this is going to work. My background is um, that I am a born and raised Edmontonian, and there aren't that many of us around, especially as old as I feel or I, I am. Um, how many people in the audience here are originally from Edmonton? Okay, so about a third. Um, how many of you are artists or consider yourself as artists? Good half. How many of you are writers? Okay. And how many of you think of yourselves or as, um, would like to see themselves become curators? Great. So I'm going to talk about all of those realms a little bit, because um, I, I think that they're very closely intertwined. Um, my background and training here in Edmonton is as a physician. I work at the Cross Cancer Institute, I work in oncology, I'm a family physician by training, and I've spent most of my career um, looking after people who are marginalized, people who um, have uh, significant challenges in their life. Um, I tend to look after the tough stuff, um, and always have, and I enjoy that. And my role is mostly as a communicator. Um, I break down medical gobbledygook and $10 words to hopefully relatively digestible bits uh, for people and families to uh, understand and absorb um, and deal with. And when people find out I started an art gallery, they all say, well, do you paint? Do you draw? Do you take pictures? Do you, you know, they immediately assume I do all of that stuff. And, and of course the answer is no, I don't. Um, I simply try and support and promote and uh, give a voice and a stage to the people who do that the very best, in my view. Um, so I grew up really with no background in the arts. I wasn't attached to visual art at all. I had really no experience with it. Um, my background is primarily in music. And anybody who's old like me will recognize SNFU. Um, so this is a seminal, call it second wave punk rock band from Edmonton who made big careers making big noise. Um, and this is, uh, this is where my youth was spent, was listening and learning about punk rock and various other types of music. In high school, I went to the British, the National Museum in London with some friends and um, walked into a room of sunflowers um, and just thought, it's kind of gloopy, gloppy paint and I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand very much. Um, 
and it didn't really have much of an impact on me. I went through university, went to medical school, and I can assure you that no group of doctors looks like this. <laughs> not, not a single one. <laughs> Um, when I was finished my medical school exams, literally just finished my medical school exams, four years of uh, medical school learning nothing but biology and medicine after four years of learning nothing but sciences, um, and just about quitting because I couldn't stand only learning one thing, I would have killed to take an English class, I would have just anything. Um, I accidentally went to southern Mexico. Um, it was purely a second choice because the other trip fell through. And I ended up um, going to a small um, beach town south of Oaxaca, um, in the state of Oaxaca. And uh, then having to head home, I had to overland to Oaxaca, which is an amazing city. And that is where all of a sudden my brain which had squeezed out all of the medical knowledge was starting to expand and absorb new things. And this is a town that has three or four different um, arts uh, secondary uh, schools. It has an incredibly long history uh, in visual communication from, from the pre-Columbian times forward. It's one of the most um, culturally dense areas anywhere in the Americas um, with a, a uh, a geographic area that has been host to numerous indigenous um, groups, Olmecs, Zapotecs, Mixtecs, Aztecs, Mayans. Um, and it also has a really vibrant, creative world now. And so I went there at a time when the economy was booming, and there was all these little tiny weird galleries that were showing art that I had never even thought ceramics installations, um, crazy, crazy uh, um, textiles and fabrics using traditional languages and contemporary techniques and everything else. And my mind was just kind of blown. Um, and it was difficult because at that point it was like, okay, well, um, really what I want is I want to be around art. And I've just spent eight years learning something else, so this is uncomfortable. Um, from there, I went to Mexico City and had a bunch of amazing experiences, but one of the most powerful things was to see some of the, the Mexico, Mexican muralists. Um, the uh, early 1900s um, was a time of great upheaval in Mexico, and out of that um, came a, a powerful social movement that incorporated the visual arts, and the three um, muralists who did the most work around Mexico, uh, and in fact around North America, uh, were uh, Jose Clemente Orozco, um, and this is his piece called Catharsis. This is a uh, piece by David Alfaro Siqueiros called Tormento de, I'm going to massacre this, Quatomec. Uh, that speaks about the plight of the original uh, people of that land. Uh, and this is the uh, redone piece by Diego Rivera um, called Man Control of the Universe. This is the second time that he did this mural. The first time he did it in uh, New York at Rockefeller Center, and it was torn down because he dared to um, portray for David Rockefeller, I believe it was David Rockefeller, um, a mural that had Lenin in it. Um, and so he vowed to, to remount it and, and, and produced it in Mexico. Uh, I came back and uh, continued with my medical training. I had another two years to do, and while I was doing that, um, I just spent a lot of time reading and learning and trying to absorb as much about visual culture as I could. Um, and I also, at that point, had in mind that I would love at some point to open a gallery because I wanted to be surrounded by art and by artists. So I tried to learn a little bit about the market, about the economies of art, um, about what the uh, what art did in a greater world than just the world that we live in. Uh, at that 
point in time, the AGA was not uh, the AGA, it was the Edmonton Art Gallery, and I was lucky enough to see a couple of exhibitions there that gave me some hope um, and sort of drew me into the Canadian visual art world. Uh, this is a piece called Forty Part Motet by Janet Cardiff and George Burris Miller, who both did their um, grad degrees here at the University of Alberta and have gone on to be probably some of the most recognized Canadian artists um, of the 20th and 21st century. Uh, this piece, if you don't get a chance to see it, it very often is um, at the National Gallery in Ottawa. They own one of the versions of this. Um, this is it mounted, I believe, in the cloisters, uh, the, the Metropolitan Cloisters in uh, um, uh, Upper Manhattan. Uh, it is a really phenomenal, phenomenal sound piece that uh, is, it's, it's difficult to describe, but certainly lots of people I've sent to it or have been around are, are brought to tears with just the simplicity and the beauty of this piece. Uh, this is another piece by um, uh, Cardiff and Miller, this is the, the killing room, uh, pardon me, a killing machine, um, which uh, again is a very potent, powerful piece that uh, takes as its <coughs> point Franz Kafka's uh, In the Penal Colony, a, a story about uh, colonialism, a story about violence of men, um, and about uh, ecstatic insight that comes through death. The other show that really sort of blew me away was the Attila Richard Lukash uh, painting show uh, curated by, I believe, by Bruce Grenville at the uh, Edmonton Art Gallery at the time. Lukash started painting in the uh, mid-80s in Vancouver and built a, a, an amazing um, following with, with sequential, really strong bodies of work that had to do with violence, had to do with skinhead culture, had to do with homoeroticism. Um, uh, really potent, powerful work. Uh, he's had his ups and downs since then, but still, this this work is really. Um, it was something like it, it was it was something that I'd never seen before in in terms of its bravery and its unflinching um, attempt to mo uh, combine beauty and and horror. Um, as my kids were growing up, I was pursuing my medical career. Uh, again, I would travel every once in a while, uh, not very often, um, but I had the great fortune um, to be able to go to the Odessa Handelis Foundation uh, in Toronto, which was in this building, a sort of a nondescript building, just off King Street. And Odessa Handelis is um, a woman who uh, it comes from significant means in uh, Toronto and has amassed um, a curatorial career, I think, that is really um, way ahead of its time. She was um, <coughs> very aggressive, I'll say, in combining fine art and objects in ways to discuss contemporary society. And being able to visit her space showed me a lot of work that I wouldn't otherwise have seen. She also was very unafraid of the work that she showed. It wasn't uh, work that certainly my eyes were accustomed to seeing at that point in time. Um, this is Jeff Wall's uh, um, large scale uh, light box. Uh, sorry, I'm blanking on the name. A gust of wind after uh, Hosokai. Um, and just to see the way that he created images, to learn the way that he used scale, he used art history, um, and used sort of mundane aspects of life in a way to communicate was really powerful for me. Uh, Christian Boltansky um, has built a long career of looking back on the horrors of mid uh, 20th century European history. Uh, really affecting work. Um, Louise Bourgeois, this is the first cell that I had ever seen. Uh, and again, this is at uh, the Handel's Foundation, uh, which closed, I think, in about 2007 or eight. She went on to do a master's and to do a PhD and is now working on other things. And there's a project that she's done called Partners, which amasses some 3,000 uh, um, 
historical photographs of teddy bears. Um, she sort of came to a lot of public prominence when she um, bought a one of the original Steiff teddy bears in the early 2000s or late 1900s for a, a huge amount of money, and people thought that was absolutely ridiculous. And yet she incorporated it into some of her exhibitions, and that started her amassing sort of this collection. And this is a, a piece that's shown um, quite widely over the past couple of years. Uh, I'm, I'm waiting for an opportunity to see it because it looks quite fascinating. This is an example of some of the photographs. Very personal, very, um, very cute, and horrible at the same time. Um, further in my travels, I was able to visit a couple of other private collections. This is from the Hess Collection in Nava Valley. They're a, a um, group of, I believe, Austrian uh, family of winemakers who have a beautiful vineyard there and have an, an amazing collection in the literally sort of up in the hills and out the valley. And I was invited to a dinner there um, as part of my medical um, things and was just blown away that this gigantic building that we had dinner in the middle of in their library, which was three times the size of this room, and it was probably 30 feet high, thousands and thousands of volumes of art books. I didn't even eat dinner. I spent the whole time just looking and, and seeing what this kind of collecting looked like. Um, uh, Magdalena Balakanovic, uh, a top, a Polish uh, sculptor, um, using bodies and body parts uh, in an aggressive way. Um, and some kefir in the lower left, um, uh, working with uh, lead, the, the book uh, on the right side of the image here. Um, is actually completely unfolded sheets of lead. I don't even know how engineering-wise they would have supported it. Um, and on the right-hand side uh, is a, uh, is a uh, collection of Basilet works, Basilet's works, uh, sculpture and painting. But to see that people in the world actually like bought and lived with these artworks, which are guttural, Works. They're not pretty objects. They're not decorative. Um, it was a it was a really amazing thing for me. Um, with that, I started acquiring works when I could and buying things. I found myself growing and um, changing in terms of what I was uh, looking at and drawn to. This is a piece by Tammy Sozel, who's been teaching here as well. Um, a piece called uh, Deliverance that. Um, uses a lot of art historical tropes and just a, a, a really luscious way of using uh, paint. Um, this is a piece uh, that uh, is no longer. This is a Christy Malakoff folded money piece that I acquired um, out of her show at Latitude 53. I had it for six days. Um, it's five different currencies, uh, absolutely beautifully um, folded and assembled uh, into a beautiful nighttime snack for my dog. <laughs> um, I, I have one other picture of what it looked like coming out of his backside at the dog park. Um, and the dog's still alive. I didn't know that. Um, so I tried to buy little things and collect little things. Um, and that was great. I loved having the art around. Um, certainly I, I, I bought work that, that I fell in love with and still love to this day. Um, but I, it wasn't super fulfilling and I was doing more traveling, more looking, and I realized that what I really wanted to try and do is work with artists and, and try and help them see their vision come forward. And so one of the first projects that I got involved with was Gary Chong's 12 Tones, um, where he had an idea to explore a scientific phenomenon and uh, we talked about the ways of exploring that, but I also tried to help him find a way to produce it when, uh, when grants didn't come through. And that sort of gave me a taste of what it takes for artists to see their vision to the, to the max, to try and take it as far as they could, to, to not to make it just good enough, but to take it way beyond that. And, and I could see that that's something that, um, that is, it's, it's a huge challenge and it's difficult to do, but when, when people are given the opportunity to do that, amazing.
amazing things happen. And, and importantly, as I was traveling, I also realized that that is where things need to be taken to for people, um, for people to be able to then make a leap into, um, into the international world or the national scene. Um, in small communities, uh, and it's not just Edmonton, but in small communities everywhere, it can be get, become very cloistered and sort of navel-gazy, and people um, sometimes will sort of, they, they take it, and there isn't anybody there to push or pull them further. They know maybe they need to go further, but this is good enough. But good enough, as the t-shirt is going to say, good enough just isn't fucking good enough. And, and so to try and help artists um, go that whole way was what I wanted to do. Um, the Bear Fruit, um, when Gary, shortly after 12 Tones was launched, was contacted by curators in Toronto and asked um, you know, to, to expand the visual language that he was using to, to take it even further, creating an a, a installation and, and a mosaic piece called Ouroboros, which was first shown in Toronto. And we have since shown that piece uh, in Montreal. Uh, and uh, it was a big part of uh, Edmonton's first wave launch um, in a very large iteration. Um, I also did more traveling. And I was traveling to New York. I was traveling to whenever I could get away um, to see things and, and, and just try and absorb what art was in other places. Um, because I, I, I knew that it was different from what I was seeing here. And I would do the rounds in the galleries here and just not find what I was seeing in other parts of the world that spoke to me and that hit me in the gut or just knocked me over. Um, the installation on the left-hand side is a, a piece that um, uh, my, I and my kids saw in New York at, uh, at MoMA by an artist named Song Dong. And it, it, it was what I might have formally called shit on the floor art except it was the most amazingly collected and presented shit on the floor art you've ever seen. And what he had done is he had gone back after his father's death um, to try and help his mother, who was having a great deal of difficulty. And he basically tore their house apart and, and collected and organized everything that she had been keeping since before the Cultural Revolution, every piece of string, every pop bottle, every cookie tin, Everything. It was all organized, and, and so he actually showed this entire thing in MoMA and has shown it around the world since then. And it, it just it changed my idea of what art could be. On the bottom right hand side is an art fair, and I'll talk a little bit about those. But as I was doing this, it was quite clear that from an international point of view, our commerce was changing, that the role of the gallery was changing, and that um, a huge amount of the commerce of art was happening at these things called art fairs. And um, they are really not super easy to describe if you've never been to one. But they happen literally around the world. At this point in time, this would have been probably about 2007, 2008, 2009, there was probably somewhere around 100, 120 art fairs um, that happened around the world. And that seemed like a lot. There's now over 300. And they are um, places where um, hundreds and sometimes thousands of galleries, literally from around the world, will come to a place. Miami was the most recent big um, cluster of fairs in December. And I've been a couple of times. And the, when I was there, there was 22 different art fairs. Counting up galleries, there was over 1,200 galleries in Miami from all over the world showing their artists at that point in time, and people flying in from all over the world on private planes and yachts and hitchhiking and just art junkies and art lovers. And, um, and it showed me just about the business, about how international art was becoming. And it made me think about whether a small place like Edmonton could actually make inroads into that kind of a world, because I felt like for artists to be able to have the opportunities to take it as far as they could. That was something that needed to at least be explored. New York um, is an amazing place. If, if you haven't been at some point in your life, I hope you'll be able to go. It, it really is a phenomenal experience. Um, and there's so many amazing things that you can do there. Um, this is the you know, 
New York from the sky. On the right hand side is a, um, a piece called Dreamhouse, which is a sound uh, environment and sound experience um, by Lamont Young and Marianne Zazila uh, that is set up as a permanent installation. It's moved around Lower Manhattan a couple of times, um, but it's this drone-based um, sound piece that I fell fast asleep in the weirdest dreams ever. Um, and it was just such an amazing experience to, to, to see that that also could be art. And then I came home and I started looking for a place to open a gallery. Um, because I felt like that's something that needed to happen. I was tired of waiting for somebody else to open a gallery that would show work that would speak to me. Um, and I spent about two or three years not finding the right place and then walking into a place I had actually called the number on the uh, upper right several times uh, and being either um, never gotten a call back and when I finally got through to somebody they said, oh, you want to open an art gallery? You can't do that in here. There's no way. And I walked in and the place was gross and grotty, but it, just the volume and the way the ceilings were and just what I could envision was exactly what I wanted and it was like the galleries that I'd gone to in East London or in Chelsea. It was about volume and space as a showcase for visual communication. So there was a bunch of renovations, ripping stuff out, building walls. Um, and gradually we got to the point where we could start installing work, and that was in 2000, 2012. And that was, that was the birth of um, DC3R projects. And uh, it's been a great experience um, and a challenging one. Uh, the Canadian art market is absolutely minuscule compared to the, uh, the world of art out, outside of Canada. Um, and it's one that really is overshadowed. We have these neighbors down below us that have a different way of approaching art, they have a different way of approaching business. And, and it's really difficult for Canadian galleries to be seen and to have opportunities. Um, but that's what we're working uh, to try and change. And, and, and the big thing is that the globalization of art really is where opportunity is for artists and for galleries. Um, and it's opportunities that, uh, that, are, that are challenging, they're interesting, fascinating, they're super expensive. Um, but there's, there is something there that, um, that we're trying to reach towards as a gallery um, that's where we see ourselves going. So this is an example of one of these gigantic art fairs. This is Governor's Island in the middle of the East River. Um, it's a huge tent where Free's uh, art fair is held every May, and the volumes, the expanses, the, 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 the art that's there is, um, some of it is great, some of it is honestly not great. The galleries that are there are um, the, the blue chippest of the blue chip of con contemporary art galleries around the world. And it was interesting going to these fairs and seeing that um, the, the, the best of the work that's there is phenomenal. And that the rest of it was um, no better and sometimes not as good as the work that I could see artists around me or artists I was aware of producing. And so this is um, something that we, that as a gallery, we're trying to make inroads into, but it's a really difficult political and social and economic um, journey. This is Art Basel, I believe, in 2016. Um, again, one of the biggest fairs in the world, um, and it's a zoo, honestly. It, it, it is just so big. There's some 300 galleries um, under one gigantic convention center. Everybody has a booth of varying sizes. Everybody's trying to get attention. Um, it's not a great way of seeing art. Art doesn't look good in fairs necessarily. Um, it isn't 
certainly a way, a great way of presenting art, but it's an amazing way of seeing a lot of art in a very short period of time. It's a, I found it really a useful way of going in and being able to train my eye to, to, to pick out the things that would speak to me fairly quickly and to weed out the other stuff. Um, and the people watching is unbelievable. Um, so now, we as a gallery are um, doing a number of fairs around uh, the world. Um, this is part of my life. This is driving a truck full of artwork to New York for Volta New York. Last year, we presented a solo presentation of Tammy Sozo's um, installation and <coughs> painting. Uh, and so I got the uh, distinct pleasure of overnight driving and dealing with customs and borders and all that sort of thing. So that is, I'm going to call that the low point of the year. Um, and this is the high point. This is the high point. I got to be a meme in Canadian art cats. Um, there's some amazing people and some amazing uh, experiences that, um, that I, I've been able to have because of my role with the gallery because of my shared passions with a whole bunch of really weird people who are as insane as I am. Um, and this was a high point. So um, at this point, five years still alive, these C3F projects. What I'd like to do is um, I'm not going to go through the, uh, maybe I will actually. Um, will it let me click on that? No, it's not working. Anybody know if there's a way of Um, I'm just gonna I'm gonna run through a couple of things that I'm really proud of in our gallery history. Um, the the big achievements that we that I've really tried to push for are to get artist works to show amazing things here in Edmonton, whether they're the artists that we're working with on a, on an ongoing basis or whether they're exhibitions that we're bringing in and incorporating artists from from across Canada or across the world and. Um, so I'm very proud of the programming that we have, that we've put together through DC3 Art Projects. I would put it up against any commercial gallery in Canada, of any size, in any place. Um, it is that strong, and I say that because people tell me that. Um, it's frustrating at times because we live in a small community, and um, and sometimes we get more people interested in what we're doing from other places than we do from here. We have people who will call from, you know, from the eastern seaboard and say, how did you get all these artists in one show when they're all coming on our radar from different directions? And we look and they're all in your show. That happened with a show called Industry last year that combined uh, works by uh, nine, nine artists from um, as far away as Malta, LA, London, Switzerland, um, and as near as Edmonton, uh, all of whom were looking at uh, human aesthetics, at um, aspects of beauty, and the industries that surround it, so cosmetics and plastic surgery, and um, form-fitting garments, and modeling, and uh, the, the fashion industry, and that sort of thing. Um, I'm really proud of the projects that we've done outside of Edmonton as well, because we've tried to focus on taking exhibitions wherever we go. Even if it's a fair for four days, it's an exhibition. It has to be cohesive, it is curated, it's thought of, it is either a solo exhibition or it is uh, a idea-based presentation of work that we feel belongs together. We've also done pop-ups, and so in those um, events, we've taken uh, projects by the artists we work with and shown them in other cities. We've taken over small gallery spaces and pr 
put up shows that will last anywhere from three, two to four weeks, um, and to try and bring out these projects that might not otherwise be seen. Uh, artists that didn't have a lot of visibility maybe in, in Montreal where we've done pro uh, projects. Um, we did a project with Tammy Sossel's installation, The Cleansing, um, that because we had um, uh, shown it in Montreal, I tried to time it around a fair that was happening in Montreal. It was seen by the fair directors at For Art Toronto who said, you know, can you realize this um, in our Toronto? Because we'd love to have something like this as a feature project. And I said, absolutely, we can do this before I checked with Tammy and before we looked at the logistics and everything else. And we managed to do it um, and do it well. Uh, we showed Ouroboros, the piece that I mentioned of Gary Jones in, um, in Montreal during a major electronic um, music festival in Montreal, specifically choosing that time so that the audience that we hoped to be able to get in would understand the work um, in a, perhaps a different way than a general audience would. And out of that, um, I think it's fair to say that there was a number of performances that sort of piggybacked on that exposure. Um, we also uh, have done a pop-up in LA where the gallery director Michelle Schultz took a group of artists from our program and put them together with several artists who were down in LA that we could see were sort of on the, on the sort of steep slope of an ascent to try and get curatorial awareness to get people aware of the artists that we were showing up here. And the audience down there, um, again, we timed it around a specific event when she knew that there was going to be people from major galleries who were all there for a social event. Um, and the, the, the response was phenomenal in that people were blown away by the quality of the work that we were showing. They had no idea how the work of this quality could be happening, and yet they completely off the radar, which is a theme for Edmonton. Um, some of the group shows that we've done at the gallery, one in particular I'm really uh, proud of is Our Families, the Impact of Contemporary Family on Art. And it was my goal on opening the gallery that at some point in my career I wanted to show a piece called A.A. Bronson, and I'm sorry I don't have an image of this, uh, a piece by A.A. Bronson, which is a photograph of um, the the second member of general idea to die in a nine month period of <coughs> HIV AIDS. Um, they, the photograph is, is really devastating. It's uh, Felix um, who passed away a couple of hours before the photograph was taken and, uh, and it's him dressed up to receive his community clearly dead, wasted, emaciated, um, a shell of a human being and yet it's the last general idea piece that was ever done. It was shot by A.A. or A.A. Bronson, or it was at least coordinated by A.A. Bronson, um, and it was a family portrait. They were a family, they were a business together, all three of them, um, and it was a really important piece for me to be able to show. So to be able to show that in the first 18 months of being open was, was a coup, and especially to be able to show that along with um, two other senior artists in Canada, um, Mary Wagshall, a group of paintings that um, that went basically from our gallery to the Musée des Beaux-Arts in Montreal as a solo show, um, and uh, gigantic silver print um, photographs of of a naked 82-year-old woman who happened to be the mother of Evergon, who spoke in the fall, um, and that was a really, really heartfelt, beautiful, and melancholy exhibition. Um, but it's one that I'm very proud of. So this is a piece that showed up at Art uh, Basel, Miami Beach in December. And it's by a, an artist named William Pauheide, who has um, a social practice, who does drawing uh, and does research into um, and critique of the art world. And I thought this was sort of apropos, what the fuck is the art world? And he has a whole lot of ideas that he's put down there, and some of them are, are some of them are right on. Um, all of them are probably right on for some people. Um, 
my favorite is it's never quite what you hoped for. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about the way that I see an art ecosystem. And I, I look at, 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 at the potential for any place and any group of artists as being like any other biologic system. And it has lots of challenges and lots of opportunities. Um, and so I'd like to just present some of the ways that I think about it. Um, because I think that there are some things that as writers, as curators, as artists, as people who love all of the above, there are some opportunities to try and make this community, which is already very vibrant, um, even stronger. And my hope is that through doing that as a community, we can also make it more visible. Edmonton struggles um, because of geography, we struggle because of distance, we struggle because we are always the little brother to other larger communities. Um, and, and, and I think that there are some opportunities to, to change some of that. But it's going to take some talk and some thinking. Um, I've watched uh, Canadian and our local art scene for a long time. And I've seen some burbles of energy and some people who were really on the cusp of things leave. And I believe they had to leave. Um, and I've seen people who I thought things could happen and they just kind of died. Um, and I've seen opportunities lost. And, and I think that's something that, that, that can change. And I think it's also um, symptomatic of the Canadian art scene as well. Um, Canada, as I said, is, is overshadowed by a very large neighbor. Um, and they're really loud and they're really boisterous and rambunctious. And their art ecosystem works in a slightly different way um, to Canada's. Um, but the, well, there are the odd inroad of Canadian historical and contemporary art into the international world, it, nothing really takes. It seems like um, there was a show called Oh Canada that was produced by Mass Mocha about four or five, six years ago, um, that uh, that seemed like it was would be you know a springboard for a bunch of really great contemporary artists in Canada because all of a sudden there was this great big stage they were going to be placed on um, in Mass Mocha. Phenomenal curator, great writing, there's a great book that was produced, everything else, and it just kind of fizzled afterwards, it seems to me. And I could be wrong about that, but I don't see that it sort of got the lift that I had hoped that it would get. Um, historically, you know, Warren Harris has, you know, had a recent show at the Hammer Museum. Um, there's shows at the Dulwich Picture Museum in London, and yet people are always so impressed by what gets shown in these exhibitions, and yet it just doesn't make it onto the onto the international stage either um, visibly or financially, which is unfortunately a big part of um, how art is discussed and measured and written and talked about now. Locally, uh, Edmonton has had an art gallery since I believe the night late 1920s um, that was started and um, grew and grew through the local community. The Edmonton Art Gallery in the 1970s nurtured collectors. Um, uh, they were actively collecting um, art of a particular type and they were nurturing Edmontonians of means and not of means but who were passionate to actively collect work. And so there are strong collections that stopped basically in 1982. And there was um, economic reasons for that. And, and, and I think there was sort of a um, somewhat uh, blindered approach to what art was at that time. Um, that um, means that there are some amazing, uh, amazing works of art by Anthony Caro, by Alan Frankenthaler, by um, Poons and Litsky. Um, Phenomenal artists who will have their place in the canon, um, but they um, 
that language and that kind of visual creativity sort of was put up as a on a pinnacle, and then there wasn't a whole lot of translation of that need to acquire that interest and in dialogue about contemporary art that that would continue and become an intergenerational interest. And so Edmonton, I think, kind of died on the vine a little bit at that point in time. Um, and I think it sort of got left out a little bit of a lot of things that happened from there. Um, that was a point in time when, at least to my eyes, the single movement or the sort of focused movement of creativity kind of dissipated and all of a sudden people are shooting off in all directions. It was, you know, the postmodern movement. It was all sorts of different ways of looking at and creating art and that sort of thing. And, and that didn't translate as well here, I think, maybe as it could have. Um, the shrinkage that happens in a community, um, any sort of system, um, happens when there's no challenge, um, when there's no um, push to evolve, push to grow in sort of in biologic terms. There's no stress on the system, and the, so the system doesn't adapt and shift and change and improve. And so um, I think that a healthy community has to include chaos and organization. It has to have both sides. There has to be change and adaptation. Um, there needs to be discussion and dialogue about creativity and what art is, what it can be, what people are doing. There needs to be arguments and there needs to be debate and there needs to be differing opinions and all of that helps to create a living system that starts to grow. Um, the infrastructure that supports those communities includes institutions, it includes um, a lot of different things. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But um, what I've tried to do with DC3R projects is, that, is identify gaps. One is, is the promotion and the distribution and the production of work um, by artists that, that I believe in. The other thing is to try and create other, fill in other gaps for the art community here that I've seen in comparing it with other places. And one of the big things um, is the lack of studios here in Edmonton. There just has always been really not a lot of active studios and, and students, master students, they'll come out and they sort of don't necessarily have a place to go and interact and fight with their colleagues and sort of push um, and be pushed. And so that's something that I've seen in traveling in other places that happens through clusters of artists in studio buildings where if you're struggling, if you you know are stuck on a piece, then there's somebody to go to and say, hey, can you give me take a look at this and tell me why I because I'm too close, I don't know what's going on. Um, but it also provides an opportunity for artists to get together and say, well, you know what? That's not your best work. I don't get what you're doing there. That is that just isn't speaking to me at all. This piece is, you know, this section is working, but all of us need to be called out and you know, lifted up and called out for the things that are working and the things that aren't working, no matter what you're talking about. And I think that that's something that um, I'm hoping in opening, opening a set of studios next to DC through our projects that we'll be able to start to foster and encourage for the young artists who stay here. Um, maybe they're creating a body of work um, to be able to then go on to grad school. Maybe they're just working to build their own practice and establish what that means, uh, but that's something, that's a gap that, that I had wanted to try and fit, fill. Um, but there's some gaps that I can't fill, that a gallery can't fill. Um, and so I'd like to talk about those a little bit now, and that's why I asked about writing and curating. Um, I see artists and writers as curators, artists and writers and curators as being part of a symbiotic relationship. Um, they are, um, they're sort of mutually dependent, okay? and they can lift each other up by challenging each other. Um, and I think that it becomes a really important part of a vibrant, growing scene. Um, artists who are making work in isolation, who don't have feedback, who don't have anybody calling them out, they may not be pushed to do the best work. 
Um, and so um, this is a list of what I see as being needs. Um, and, and, and again, this is simply my way of thinking about an art community, but um, I see that artists need funding. They need funding for education, for living expenses, for production of their work. They need a place and time to work. They need a nest of co-conspirators and access to models of success. They need people who, who can lay the pathway to say, this is how I do it. It may not be right for you, but this is how I've gotten to this point. This is how I've gotten shows. This is how I've you know, found a dealer. This is how um, I've worked with uh, you, know, you know, a bunch of people and created a, you know, a do-it-yourself scene. We created a gallery of our own. We did pop-up shows. We did this sort of thing. But that kind of energy is really important. Patrons are required to support work by supporting educational institutions, and I know the U of A is always challenged with finances, as I think all institutions are. Um, for artists who are sitting in the audience, your patrons aren't necessarily people, hopefully they're people who will buy your work, but they may not be that. They might be your parents um, who are helping you get through this. They might be friends who are just really eager to see you succeed and are there to cheerlead you along the way. Um, they, uh, um, they are the people who do support the university. They are the people who try and build opportunity, who find funding for the university and all that sort of thing. Um, and they're collectors. Okay? And they're the people who get together and talk about work and the people who are junkies and you know, they're just interested in what's going on. All of those people um, help artists. For curators, they need some of the same things. They need space and time, they need money, monetary support for exhibitions. Um, including insurance and shipping and time to write and uh, writer's fees and all that sort of thing. But curators need space. They either need to find space to put shows in or they need to um, have gallery spaces that they can work in. And without that, then curators won't create the energy that feeds back with the artists. Um, they also need mentors and collaborators. They need to see people who've been able to make a success in this field that they want to pursue. Um, they need to see pathways, breadcrumbs that allow them to sort of find a way to do what they want to do, what they have, the ideas they have in their brain. Um, they need the ability to think about curatorial projects not only once they get out, not only once they find that impossible job that isn't, you know, isn't going to materialize. They need the opportunity to do it earlier. Um, and I think that that becomes an important part of the institution's role. Um, so, and I'm talking about educational institutions here. Um, I look at the paucity of exhibiting opportunities for artists and curating opportunities for young curators here. And it's, it's, it's I wish I had a magic wand that I could just change it. But that's something that I, I feel like it, 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 if that can happen, and it might just come from a, you know, a band of young people who just decide, you know, screw it, we're going to do it ourselves. That's the kind of energy that will bring things forward. Um, writers, 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 writers. Um, there's a master's program here in art history. There's amazing profs. There's academic writing going on. There's very little critical writing happening about exhibitions anywhere in the city. Um, there's, and I know that there's not a whole lot of venues, but the writing is super, super important because people aren't coming here from other places. They're looking online for reviews. They're looking at stuff that shows up on Instagram and following that lead to a review of an exhibition that maybe drew their attention through that square snap on their phone. Um, writers are super, super important part of things, and we, I, haven't been able to figure a way to nurture writers. And so that also becomes something I would ask you guys to think about, talk with your friends about, figure out, go to shows and write a paragraph. Write a blog post. You know, if you're ever in a situation where you go to something and think, that was brutal, and you need to cut it up, or it was phenomenal, and you need to lift it up, then write it, okay? If you need to know where you can send it, you know, speak with your profs. Speak with us at the gallery, Michelle or I. Speak with the other gallerists in town. 
where can I pitch this? Okay, there are places you can pitch, and because there haven't been writers who are actively doing this, there isn't that trail of breadcrumbs. Okay, but it can be built, and that's something that I hope can come out of changes in the community. But again, for me, I see it as a symbiotic loop. Okay, if the writer is pushing the curator to do better, and the curator is saying, no, the artists need to do better, and the artists are saying, no, we need people writing about this, then all of a sudden, everybody's reaching. The bar goes up, everybody's pushing harder and harder, and good enough isn't and good enough anymore. Okay? That's something that I think is really important. So building creators requires, as I said, supports in various ways, and I'd like to talk about things that artists can do things to think about as you're figuring out how do I do this thing that seems impossible. Um, I think that, and I already said it, this visiting speaker program is essential. Okay, and other places have really been able to take advantage of movement of thinkers and writers and curators and artists. Um, we're a little bit off the path. Okay, ACAD in Calgary gets to take advantage of people that are coming and going from Banff and Lethbridge to take in a really, really strong stance in the need to have people coming through there. And this is something that that, that, um, that Jesse and, and, and Natalie and the rest of the team are really working on. And it's imperative because curators need to see what's going on here. And writers need to write about what's going on here. And people from outside of our sort of area don't know what's going on, and they won't know what's going on unless we can get them in. Okay, so this is super important. Um, and sharing has to happen, and, and I see it all the time in, in smaller communities. It happens not just in Edmonton, it happens in Calgary, it happens in Saskatoon, it happens in Winnipeg, where everybody's sort of trying to hold on to everything so tightly, and if I let it go, somebody else will get it, and it doesn't, it won't be there anymore. And 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 it, it isn't a zero-sum game. You know, if somebody in a community is doing amazing things and somebody else starts to lift that person up and broadcast, hey, that person over there is doing amazing things, they make more noise together. Okay, and that's something that, you know, I hope institutions, the, the, the educational institutions, and I hope that the, um, the museums and the artist-run centers and, and the commercial galleries and the artists and the curators can all start to do a little bit more of is lifting each other up and broadcasting and shouting together because they will make more noise that way. Residencies. Um, for the young artists who are out there, residencies are becoming a really important touch point for moving your career forward in part because it exposes you to new ideas, new practice, new materials, new places, you know, new songs and stories and new, you know, bodies of water and mountains and everything else. But it really is also important for you building your own network and connecting with new people who maybe have come from four corners of the planet. All of them are going to go away and some of them will do things and others won't do anything at all and somebody might become the next rock star. Right? And if you've connected with them, if you have a simpatico kind of relationship, then they might, at that point, go, you know what? I'm curating this show, and I met this person in Iceland, and the work they were doing is really, really fits with this. Or my friend is curating the show, and I'm going to let them know about that. And that, that's what happens. Cross-pollination. Again, it's a biologic term. You know, but this is about health and systems. Um, if you get a chance, go. Okay? And uh, the same thing for curators and writers. There are, re there are residencies in Banff, but there are residencies literally on every corner of the globe. And if you can get there, go. If you have a horrible experience, you're still going to have learned something, and you'll have met people, and you'll have connected. This is how curators and artists and writers start to cluster again outside of the region. Supports. This is all of the things that a practicing artist needs to be able to do what they do. Okay? And part of it is books and magazines. Okay? And that's part of the reason that at the gallery we've opened Bookshop by DC3. And it's, um, it's a way of trying to create ideas and, and, and bring new things into the community. But 
studios I've already talked about, art supplies, framers, crate building. Crate building is really difficult to, to manage around here. Everybody's used to building crates for gigantic pieces of you know, industrial um, equipment. But there isn't a lot of knowledge and thought about how do you ship paintings? How do you protect you know, oil and canvas that might still be wet? So those are systems that need to be in place for artists who start to get opportunities then to be able to take those opportunities. Shipping. Shipping is a nightmare for us as a gallery. It costs a fortune to ship our work. And we're a long way from everywhere. Right? But there might be ways that you know, artists or galleries or people who are shipping back and forth might be able to share the bill. Okay? Or maybe I'm driving something to Calgary and you've got something that needs to go. Again, it's that sharing culture rather than I'm going to hold it tight and close and not let anybody know. Storage, documentation, archiving, photography, um, installers, fabricators, all of these things are essential for, for all opportunities to be able to be reached. Funders. Funders, as I talked about, come from lots of different directions. In Canada, funding is primarily through governmental and NGO sources. Okay? And that's very different from our southern neighbors, where the vast majority of funding for the arts comes through private philanthropy. It's a very different way of doing things. Um, and it, it has its pros and it has its cons. Okay? In part, one of the pros is they got a whole lot of money. They've got people that are down there who, who are willing to support the arts in a way that you can't even fathom okay? because they're passionate about it. And it isn't sort of some administrative agency. It's people who want to see things happen. And there's some real, you know, there's some real um, advantages to that. It's also really at the mercy of market forces. Okay, and, and so that tends to change the kind of art that might be produced. It might change the kind of visual communication that's used. It's different. Not better, not worse. In Europe, it, depending on the country, it's a mix of these things. Um, and, and they have a, you know, both the US and Europe have a longer history of, of private philanthropy, of collecting, of, uh, of art literacy. Right? And so there's a different kind of engagement with the notion of having artwork, supporting artists, living with original art, okay? Because they've grown up with it. It's in their elementary schools. It's in the church they went to. It's you know, it's walking down the street, seeing it in people's windows. It's a different thing. Yeah. Um, building credibility. This is another side of things. Um, this is where the writer and the the writer and critic becomes really important. Okay? They have a power to talk about work, to talk about things that are happening, good or bad, and get it out there. The curator, again, the curator is somebody who's assembling ideas, assembling artists, assembling artworks in a way that they'll, they may have the opportunity then to present and to cluster and to um, uh, get it out there and building the credibility of things. Um, Biennials, these are, there's, again, like what art fairs, there um, used to be, um, I think, five or eight years ago, there was about 50 around the world. That's doubled now, and that, that's an underestimation. Some of them are strong, some of them are weak. Um, some of them, they all have different focuses. Um, one of the difficulties that I see is that a lot of the models um, sort of promote the chosen curator. So there's the star curators that everybody wants for the biennial, and that curator typically works with a cluster of eight or 10 or 15 or 20 artists, and so they do this biennial, and it's that 20 artists with three extras, and then they do another biennial, and it's 15 of those 20 with three extras, and it kind of becomes, it has the risk of becoming a greatest hits package. Um, they're incredibly expensive to produce. Um, the, the documenta is, is sort of the, the latest um, controversy in Europe. It happened just this last summer. And they went some ridiculous $15 million over budget, and a budget that was already some $50 million. 
Um, and there, I'm sure that there's a million stories as to why that happened, and everybody's going to blame everybody else, but they're incredibly expensive. Um, they're reliant on the market, and so while they're supposed to be independent from sales, they're not. And there are collectors who will go only to biennials and only buy work out of biennials because that's the work they want to see, that's the, the work they want to bring in. Um, but, you know, biennials cost a huge amount of money to produce and governments don't have them. So the Venice Biennial, for instance, um, is sort of the best known one. Canada has a pavilion, they send their artists um, they choose an artist, they have two years to make work, but they also have to make enough money to be able to do the biennial. And the National Gallery helps, and private philanthropists help, but it's this huge <coughs> amount of money. In the Europe, in Europe and the US, um, you see, you'll see at the big biennials, it's a cluster of artists, all of whom are represented by a very small number of galleries these gigantic, huge mega galleries, the Gagosians and the Zwerners and the Hauser and Wirths. And, and that happens because those are the only galleries who have the cash flow to be able to support the artist, to get the artist out there, knowing that eventually having that artist out there means the collectors are going to come in back into them and they'll make the money back. But it means there's a concentration at the top end, there's a concentration of the, the artists who are already known and the galleries who already have the programs that everybody's buying from. So that's just something that is a challenge. Um, having said that, involvement in an international event can launch a career. Okay? So we've seen that with Cardiff and Miller. Okay? They really blew up after they presented it at uh, Venice. Same with David Altman. Um, somebody who was an artist artist and people knew about the work within the scene, but he got picked up by a major gallery when he blew everybody away um, at Venice, and that's sort of how he made his inroads. Um, institutions, an institution supporting an artist can make a career. A curator supporting a particular artist can make a career. Funders, um, there's validation that comes with getting a Canada Council grant. There's validation in an academic field that comes from getting a shirk. There's validation from, uh, in, in the US, if you have a Fulbright, okay, that goes on your CV and that validates what you're doing. In the art world, validation is key. So I may, you know, I may. People might be drawn to what you're doing, but they need somebody else to say, yeah, we agree with you. That, that thing that you're doing is really hot. Okay, that's really great, and we want to invest in that. Um, the Sobe Award. Um, Sobe Award is one of the richest contemporary art prizes in the world, $50,000. Okay. The Turner Prize is less than half that. Okay. But the Sobe Prize is virtually unknown in the rest of the world. And that's a challenge that we run up against, okay. again, those big shadows that we sit under. Um, a gallery, the right gallery, can make an artist's career. Okay, and if you follow artist careers, you'll see that somebody will be, you know, bumping along, and they're just they're they, they, they're building. They've got academic interests. They're critically acclaimed, all of that sort of thing, and then they get picked up by the A-list gallery, and all of a sudden, just everything explodes. All opportunity opens up for them. And um, the gallery scene is a hierarchy. So there are A-list, B-list, D-list, Z-list galleries. And all of that is sort of a political game that's, you know, that we all deal with. I don't like it. It's distasteful. And yet it's the system that, that, that we have to work in. Um, and I've just, co collectors can also build credibility in that if you're an artist and you have work that goes into the right collection, A, those collectors, it, good collectors want their work seen and they will share with everybody what they just bought. Okay, so that helps push a career. Um, and it can also undermine a career. Okay, in that if they unload that work or if you have somebody who's come in and bought bunch of stuff and then makes it quite plain that they're unloading it or it ends up going to auction, 
then that can really undermine a, a, an artist's worth, and that was seen fairly, fairly drastically in the early late '80s, early '90s, with a lot of the artists who had made huge strides in, in during the, the mid '80s. Um, disseminating the creations, okay, and this is sort of a slightly different side of things. Dissemination, where the works and artists are exposed and to whom is a cryptic maze of politics and influence. This is the start of the market forces that lead to capacity building. Galleries work to try and optimize this level of influence, but it requires deep networks and sustainable resources. This is the long game. Um, the gallery that I started, our focus has always been, our mandate has always been to show work that I knew I could take anywhere in the contemporary art world and have it respected as being contemporary, as being rig ri um, rigorous, um, as being interesting to a global eye, not simply regional, not decorative, not, nothing, not that those things are bad, that's just not what I was interested in. Um, but what that means is that it's not always the easiest work to place. It's not always the easiest work to find buyers for it. Um, but it is the work that I believe in, and I believe in the long game. And that's where capacity comes. Sales are only part of building capacity. Artists need to be able to pay their rent, they need to be able to buy food, they need to be able to pay for their studio and buy supplies. Um, galleries also need that. Um, there has to be financial viability, and this is the great balance. Um, Artists in Canada have the opportunity to apply for grants. The um, AFA, the Edmonton Arts Council, the Canada Council, they're amazing granting agencies and, and, and they do some things really well and they do some things maybe not so well, but there's a lot of money that artists are able to apply for. It doesn't mean you're gonna get it. It's always worth applying. Um, and it's a, it's, it, there's an art to doing it. Um, as a gallery, we struggle because there's very little that we can do to get access to any sort of public funding. Um, and um, they, because they don't, they don't give grants to commercial enterprise. That's shifting a little bit. Canada Council is starting to recognize that trying to disseminate work outside of Canada is incredibly expensive to do. And starting to recognize that a little bit, but it's still a real challenge. Um, <coughs> I think what's going to happen over the next few years is that um, the 300 some art fairs that are going on around the world on the calendar are going to shrink down substantially. The big fairs are going to get bigger, smaller fairs are going to disappear. Big galleries are going to get bigger, smaller galleries are going to disappear. It's a really, it's a really challenging time, but it also means that there's opportunities. Um, I think that there's some interesting things happening um, as with artist collaborations, now with gallery collaborations. And instead of relying on a four-day fair where you might spend $35,000 to go to the fair, to take the work there, to show the work, to take the work down and come home, um, there may be ways of doing things differently if rather than doing that, you're partnering with a gallery in a place that you want to show your work, where, the, where your artist has an opportunity. And so we're exploring some of those things. Um, everybody talks about online, 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 online. Instagram will sell art. Instagram, Instagram will sell art to collectors who already know that artist. Instagram is great for selling things like Etsy below $200. But moving fine art, moving original larger pieces is really, really difficult unless the artist is already a blue chip. Okay, unless everybody already knows the practice, you know, then the collectors tend not to want to buy. That's that's been my experience. Um, capacity requires resources. And so one of the challenges for a small gallery in the middle of nowhere is to try and find like-minded individuals who will support the program. And that's something we struggle with all the time. It's not easy to go to Toronto three times a year to try and find the collectors who are interested in what you're doing, because they're out there. And, 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 and 
there are collectors who will, you know, who are interested in everything. It's a matter of trying to find the right ones or modifying a program. And that's a challenge in a smaller community because what you might have to modify your program to might not be what, as a gallerist, I'm interested in. And, and that doesn't mean that I'm doing it the right way or that other people aren't doing it you know, they're the right way. It's just not the way that, that sits with us. Um, I haven't talked much about auctions simply because the auction market in Canada doesn't exist. Okay, there's, there's an auction market for historical work, okay, um, Group of Seven stuff, um, a little bit the auction Matisse, but even that is pretty thin. For contemporary work, for post-war post -war and contemporary work, there's really no resale market in Canada um, that, that, that exists, and so that becomes a real challenge. Um, because in the U.S., that is part of what um, drives people's visibility. That's where all the talking and the thinking and the writing goes on, is not so much about the work necessarily, but the value of the work. And that's what gets people enthused and keeps them thinking and looking and buying. Um, but that also means that there's opportunities, and certainly there's some good auction houses in Canada who are really trying to figure out how to make a secondary market. And by secondary market, I mean this is work that, you know, I as a collective have already chosen to, to live with for a while. I, I need to, to get it out, either because it doesn't sit with what I like anymore, I need the cash, I need, you know, wall space freed up, or something like that. Um, and so there's a lot of momentum that can come with that, um, but it just doesn't exist here. But that's what I call the art ecosystem, and it's all intertwined. Um, so one of the things that I'm interested in is, as I said, collaboration, cooperation, lifting each other up. Um, there really are three places. Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal. Those are the only places from the Canadian art scene that get much in the way of press. Halifax a little bit, mostly because of NASCAD and the history of NASCAD. Um, but in terms of the, in terms of the market, in terms of um, contemporary dialogue, those are the three places, and they're always going to be like the big brothers, and they're never going to listen to their little cousins. Okay, and that's sort of what Edmonton is, Regina, Calgary to some extent, although Calgary manages to, sh to shout a bit louder, so Saskatoon certainly. Winnipeg has always been a great place for artists to make work, but it hasn't been a great place to sell work. Okay, it hasn't got a strong um, sort of, uh, it ha has it's done better in terms of writing, uh, critical writing and that sort of thing because of the presence of border crossing. Um, but one of the things that strikes me is that Saskatoon has no idea what Edmonton is doing, and Calgary does, has no idea what Regina is doing, um, and yet we're all struggling with the same challenges. I would love to see more dialogue between the artist art centers, between the commercial galleries, between the, the collecting institutions and the dominant institutions. Um, again, like I said before, working together, building bridges rather than building silos. Because I think that Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba has some of the best work that's being produced, period. Okay? And it's not being seen, it's not being talked about, it's not being written about. And I think that those three places, if we all showed it together, can make a lot more noise than we can as individual places. Um, the other the um, reason I put the map up is because of this. Um, in a world where we're always, this, we're always the younger cousin, we're always this, you know, the country cousin to the larger dominant centers in Canada, um, I think it's really difficult to get any kind of volume within our own country. It's not impossible, but the reward isn't huge, and it's, it's really difficult. Um, but to somebody who's in Dusseldorf, Edmonton is as exotic as anywhere else they're going to hear about in Canada. Right? Somebody who's in Reykjavik is going to have more in common with us in Edmonton than somebody in Toronto does. 
with Edmonton in a lot of cases. And I think the opportunities for galleries, for artists, for curators, for writers are going to come from building bridges not east-west, but north-south over the pole. I think that there is going to be as much opportunity or more opportunity for artists in terms of trying to get seen in Berlin, in Reykjavik, in Norway, in, um, in Leipzig. <coughs> Those are places where you can be exotic, you can be an unknown, but you don't have the, um, the preconceptions of what Edmonton is, what an Alberta artist might be. And so that's one of the things that I think is going to present <coughs> opportunity over the next um, decade or so. And it's something that I think as curators and writers and young artists, it's something to think about may not fit with what you see your future being, but I think that that is part of what we'll see in the future. This is from Bob and Roberta Smith, who are, uh, they are an individual who works in Britain who just throws up hilarious things and really insightful things. And I really believe this um, at a time when it's difficult to figure out what the world is actually doing. I believe that artists are what give us hope. I believe that the work that they create, I think that the energy that they put into the world is what makes the world a place worth living in. Thank you. You've got places that are empty, you've got landlords who live upstairs from them who really don't care as long as you don't tear the place down. If you want to have it for the night or if you want to have it for a week, you can have it. Whereas a lot of the empty storefronts and empty real estate here in Edmonton is owned by pension companies in Quebec and Ontario. Um, and they might have a whole empty building, but they're not going to give you any of it because it's going to cost them $15,000 to get the power turned on. They have to be going to worry about the liability. And they can't give it to you for free because they've got the value of the building on the books at $57 a square foot. And so they would rather have it empty and $57 a square foot on the, build, on the books for the whole building than give it to you for $10 a square foot because that brings down the value of the whole building. I think that's one big challenge. I think the other big challenge is just those breadcrumbs. I think that a scene that has a strong DIY background to it is more likely to be able to, 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 to get up the gumption to do it again. Okay? And the, the, the fact that the graduating class two years ago you know, did a kegger in a warehouse and got shut down by the police, but did some crazy chaos and was amazing, that's going to mean that the graduating class this year might think about their own ideas of how they might do something like that. And so part of it is momentum. Part of it is people just reaching out and saying, you know what, i got to do it myself. I need to see this happen. I need to put this into the world. It's the same, same way that people, I, I hope, people approach their creative practice, not by thinking, well, you know, what does gallery A want to see me make? Right? What do I need to see come out into the world? Okay? And, and that's something that I, I 
tell, tell students and artists all the time is don't make what you think I want to see. Okay, if what you need to see is absolutely insane and crazy, then that's what you need to make, if that's true to you. But I think it's the same with a DIY scene, is that the, the, the momentum comes from somebody finally saying, no, I need to put a rager on, okay, or I need to paint this entire sidewalk from here, three blocks down, bright pink, and just do it. Okay? And other people will say, that was cool. I have something I want to try. And they just do it. Amen, brother. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Can I ask about, um, like, personally for you, how you balance your work now as a physician with it being, having your gallery? Um, there is no balance <laughs> at all. Um, the, the gallery is a, um, it's a labor of love. I will be very happy if at some point in the future it can sustain itself. Okay, I work 100 hours a week trying to keep it going. Okay, trying to build opportunity for the gallery, build opportunity for the artists, get the work out, hopefully to find that cluster of people who will get what we're get what we're about and be willing to support us. Um, it's been a challenge here in Edmonton, a real challenge. There just is not this history of collecting. There isn't a culture of collecting. Um, and uh, and that's, that's been a struggle for us, absolutely. So there is no balance. But do you feel that your relationship with artists and the art world um, has fed back into your role as a physician? Do you say that you have to I, I'm, a, I'm a far better person because of what art brings to me, what artists gift to me in what they do. Um, and that allows me to be better at my job as a physician. Full stop.